So we're right on schedule. I plan on Colossians to go into the new year. We're right on schedule. And I, I, I'm going to share with you, I, uh, we're, we're talking about a subject today that I actually covered a couple of months ago. And boy, I was tempted to just go pull my old notes. <laughs> hey, Jesus did it. We know on a couple of occasions he just kind of pulled out his sermon, brushed it off, and gave it to him again. Why? Because they needed it. But uh, we're in Colossians chapter 3. I didn't do that, by the way. As a matter of fact, I, I got my old notes to make sure that I wasn't going over everything the same. Um, we're in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 15 today, but to put it into context, I'm going to read, start from verse 12. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Why were we called? Why were we called? Look back at the passage. To peace. Yeah. He says, uh, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. You realize that salvation is a restoration of peace between you and God. Before salvation, you were at war with God. You, you were at enmity. You were enemies of God. And when Christ stepped in and He redeemed your life, he, he paid ransom for your life. He bought you out of slavery to sin and death. He restored a right relationship with God. And there was peace. We were called to peace. But do you catch the little phrase there that he tags on at the end? And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. <clears throat> See, salvation is an intimate personal experience. But Christianity is a group thing. It's a group thing. Nobody lives their Christian life independently. God has called us to be codependent. He's called us to be knitted in and woven together in a body. Why? To reflect Himself to the world around. As God had chosen the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, through which they would be a conduit, through which He would pour out revelation of Himself to all the people. Men... Thursday night, uh, we've started a new series. We had a, 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 the Ray Vanderlaan series. And we had a really good teaching on Thursday night. He was talking about uh, why did God place Israel where he placed them? Simply put, because it was the best place to put them. They're at the crossroads between the two great civilizations of the time. The civilizations of Mesopotamia, you know, the Chaldeans and the Hittites and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, all of those over there in the Fertile Crescent, and the civilization of Egypt down at the Nile, and the, the path that went back and forth between these two places went right through dun, 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 Israel. And God put them there that they could bless all peoples through what they were, through their God. I mean, he could have put them up in Scandinavia. That would have been a long haul for Abraham. No, Abraham, keep going. <coughs> keep going. I know there's foot and a half of snow, but keep going. <laughs> he could have put them way down in South Africa. But he didn't. He put them right there, strategically located. It was not without purpose that he put them there. Okay? And he called a nation out of one man, Abraham, and they were going to be as numerous as the sands on the sea and the stars in the heaven. But through them, they were going to what? Bless all nations. 
Okay? Now, you know, a lot of people think, oh yeah, it was because Jesus came through that people group. Well, yeah. But you realize that the call was to Abraham over a thousand years before Jesus came. You will be a blessing to all people. Not just your offspring will be a blessing. Okay? Why did God choose the nation of Israel? They weren't a great people. <clears throat> Goodness. Look at Abraham's life. He got his wife taken away twice because he didn't man up and say it was his wife. Ninety years old, still childless. It, it wasn't the great people at that point. That's exactly what God chose him. That through them he might show his strength. Through their weakness, his strength would be revealed. I mean, really, you have a nation of slaves. The Egyptians are whooping on these guys. They're, they're considered gutter snipe. They're not of value. The only value they bring is the work that they can do. But that's God's people. You ever wonder why it took 400 years? 400 years? God could have delivered them at any time. Why? So that he might reveal himself. Dennis uh, has done a teaching, and, and we go through it at the Seder dinner that I think is absolutely fantastic. It's something we don't really think about. We look at the plagues that God delivered unto Egypt. Every one of those plagues is a direct assault against one of their deities. God's showing himself to be stronger than their gods. Every single one of them. Oh, look, we got a God of water. Yeah, well, you your water is blood. You know. God showed up all of their gods. The greatest civilization of that time, God showed them up. Now, you guys are nothing. Now that my people are my people, the slaves, you know those people? They're free now because they're my people. So, why did God choose us? Exact same reason. What did Paul say? I glory all the more in my weakness because it reveals his strength. So God called the nation of Israel as a group, as a people, to reveal himself. God calls Christianity as a group. As a group to reveal himself. So, Paul makes reference often to the body of Christ. We, we just made reference to it here. You know, the body of Christ is broken. We're not talking about that body. Uh, that's the physical body of Jesus and his life. But we, we are the body that is here on this earth. He is the head. We are the body. Some of you are fingernails, and some of you are elbow skin, and, and some of you are the little bumpy spot on the back of the neck. Now, I still I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I think I'm a molar. <laughs> that's what I think. I'm a molar. But see, the, the point is, the part is not really, it's neither significant nor insignificant. You see, you glory in, have you ever heard about these actresses that ensure body parts? <laughs> There's an actress that has insured her lips. If anything should go wrong with her lips, she gets money because she... I guess she makes money with her lips. I don't know. But she's in, and there's others that have insured their legs and their eyes. And, and they insure these things. <laughs> and I just, I don't get it. I mean, I, I guess I kind of do because we do have, you know, unemployment insurance. And if you're not able to do your work, something kicks in to pay you. But, but you don't need lips to flip a burger. <laughs> you don't. You can still make a living without your lips. <laughs> but the body of Christ isn't like that. We don't have one part that's valued above the others. Flip over with me, if you would, First Corinthians. I know you're already going, hey, you went to this one last time. Yeah, I got to start here. First Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to lay the groundwork and then we're going to move on.
You guys keep scooting further and further this way, pretty soon I'm going to have to stand up there. <laughs> and that's going to be really weird. And you guys switched sides, too. You guys are supposed to be there, and you're supposed to be over there. <laughs> yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this is kind of an interesting place, because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is one of Paul's uh, greatest dissertations on spiritual gifts. Okay? And he, he actually has one of the lists of gifts and how they're to operate in the church. And, and but, but right in the middle of this, he, he kind of sticks kind of a parenthetical statement. He says, starting in verse 12, For just as the body is one. How, how many parts is the body? How many bodies? It's one body. Just one. Okay. Now don't get me wrong. Yeah, there are denominations. Yeah, there's different churches of necessity. There are different churches. Why? Because we couldn't fit them all in here. <laughs> Much as we would like to, we can't fit them all in here. Now, of a shame, too many people identify, identify their Christianity by their denomination. You know, Paul addresses that. He says, oh, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. No. For who died for you? Christ. And Christ only. Okay? So when, when somebody goes, oh yeah, I'm a Baptist. And? Oh, you know, we've been Episcopals. I, I, uh, I was talking with a young man this week, and um, he said, I was born a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> How the Pope feel about that? <laughs> now they're warning them? Wow. I guess they're desperate to grow their numbers. I was born a Catholic. Don't get me wrong. You know, there, there are groups that you are more comfortable associating with. And that's okay. That's okay. As long as we understand that it's Christ that is the head of all. Okay? And we're going to read this passage. And I want you to keep in mind kind of um, the idea of denominationalism in this. Okay? Now keep in mind, denominations aren't of themselves bad. It's when one denomination says the others are not Christians that we have problems. Okay? Because in the essentials, we have unity. But in the non-essentials, we have liberty. Okay? You want to dunk them? Dunk them. You want to sprinkle them? Sprinkle them. Quite honestly, I don't see anything in here. Now, I know the baptismo, the Greek word, is to actually submerse. Okay? But I've been in places where they don't have enough water to submerse. And a sprinkle has to do. I had a friend who was a missionary who said at one time they were in such a severe drought that he baptized, he sprinkled with coconut milk. <laughs> Do you think before God that person was not baptized? No, it's not the water, it's not the sprinkling, it's not the dunking. It's their proclamation of faith. They're standing up and saying, yeah, I belong to him now. So keep in mind, denominationalism as we read this, okay? For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Trying to see the unifying thought there, God. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Boy, that should give you hope. God put me right where he wants me. He's put you right where he wants you. 
whatever that role is that He has for you to fill, He's put you there because you can do it. He's given everything that you need to be able to do it. If all were a single member, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Now, see, here's the first part of the problem that I see with a lot of people that don't get knitted into a body. They don't feel like they belong. You know, I just don't feel like I fit here. Well, that may be because you're an elbow and not a nose. But the elbow is vital. It's needed. It's necessary. But here comes the other part of the problem. This is the one that I see, I actually hear a lot today. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which, are, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, and that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. See, when you're a Christian, you give up the right to say, I have no need of you. Okay? You cannot exist as a healthy Christian without the body of Christ, a local congregation into which you are knitted in. You are fashioned. You are fit. Now, don't get me wrong. Attending church is not a requirement unto salvation. You're not going to get saved by coming to church. Okay? When you stand before Jesus, you're not going to be able to show your perfect attendance record for 48 years at Jesus Community Church and impress him. He's going to say, where's my son's blood? Okay? It's not required unto salvation. It's a direct result of. Okay? One of the things that church attendance, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying you've got to be here every Sunday. Don't, don't even go there. But what I will say is, your attendance reflects your heart. Because I've been there when it was very easy, oh, I'm not feeling well today, so I'll stay home. And then the next Sunday, it was a little bit easier to stay home. And then three months later, there was no thought to even going. I've been there. It's, it's a very dangerous trap to be in. God says you don't have that right. I have called you into my body. Now, being a part of the body doesn't mean just plunking your rumps down in these chairs. Okay? That's not it. God didn't call you to just attend church service. You understand that? He called you to something greater than that. Something better than that. Something beyond coming to church every so often and sitting down and listening to Glenn give you boring talks for 45 or 50 minutes. Okay? He's called you to something much more than that. And we're going to talk about what that is. The first thing we need to understand is church attendance. Attendance? <laughs> church attendance. <laughs> You've got to be able to laugh at yourself up here. <laughs> Church attendance is required. Okay? Required. I just said, you got to be part of the body. You are part of the body. You've got to be in there. But what, is, what are the things that come out of that? What is the advantage to being knitted into a body of believers? Now let's just check at some of the things that God has to say. What comes out of that? Okay? I don't, uh, don't, don't even bother flipping here. I'm going to run through a whole bunch of scriptures. Okay. So, first thing, 
We come together so that we can receive teaching under spiritual growth. That's, that's how we grow. Okay? Um, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, I sit at home and I read and I listen to this guy on the radio and I listen to that guy on the TV. But who catches you when you're wrong? Or who encourages you when you're right? Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They, they got together. Now, you can, you can get to the apostles' teaching. Well, you can't get the apostles' teaching, kind of. But you can get teaching from the TV, but it's kind of hard to break bread with them. It's kind of hard to break bread with them. Hebrews 10.24, 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're, we're here to lift each other up, to encourage each other, to bless each other. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Wow, did you catch that? It's by our encouraging of one another that we don't become hardened to sin. Encouraging each other how? I don't know. How do you need to be encouraged? <laughs> Today you might need to be encouraged to, hey, you, you should read a, a certain passage of Scripture. Or, hey, let me pray for you. Or, hey, how could, you know what? I've heard things are a little bit hard for you. How can we bless you today? Or it may, it may just be coming up and saying, hey, you know what? I've been praying for you. I don't know how you need to be encouraged. That's why it's a body. Okay? That's why it works. And see, it's got to work both ways. Now, there are times when God will lay somebody on my heart. And there, there have been actually quite a few of you in here where God has laid you on my heart and on Christy's heart. Sometimes he lays you on both of our hearts. Then you're in trouble. <laughs> um, not too long ago, it was Miss Vivian. And she was just, just not feeling well. We really didn't know what was going on, but both of us had been praying for her, and one day we were driving, and uh, we, we prayed together. And after we were done praying, I kind of mentioned to Christy that Vivian had really been on my heart. She said, yeah, me too. I've really been praying for her. So we prayed for her together. Um, you know, are my prayers special? Well, yeah, if God wants me to pray, but they're not any more special than yours. Well, look, Vivian's sitting here. <laughs> Vivian's here. There are other times where God has asked me to pray for somebody, and I don't know what the need is. I don't know what the problem is. And I said, well, I don't need to know. God knows. I just pray for you. So, God, I don't know what's going on with my brother and my sister in prayer. I just ask you to be that you would give them whatever it is that they need, whatever it is that they're not. We encourage one another. To stir one another up. <laughs> Hebrews 10.24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. See, if I, I left the first part of that up, we could really irritate each other. <laughs> I could be like, hey, Dennis, the Broncos stink. <laughs> I don't believe that. Are they still? They're still winning, aren't they? Okay. I don't know. It was, this was a whole lot easier when Trevor was here because if I would have said, "Hey, Trevor, the Seahawks stink," you'd have got to walk out. <laughs> but but look at what it what it follows it up with. It says, "But consider how to stir one another up to love and good works." Why? Why do we keep coming back to works? Salvation is not by works, Pastor Glenn. I know. But the works are because of salvation. You know, you got your horse, you got the cart, you put them together right, and you go the direction you want. You get them mixed up in any other way, bad things happen. <laughs> bad things happen. Salvation comes first, okay? By our faith and His grace. His grace is what is our salvation, right? After that, as proof of, an indicator of, there are works that God has already planned for you to do. Do you realize that? God has set up stuff for you to do. 
God really likes me moving chairs. I don't know why, but it seems like every church I ever go to, I move chairs. Lots of chairs. And that, hey, man, that's cool. If I'm that part of the body that, I don't know the molar moves chairs, but we moved to, hey, if that's what he said for me to do, then by golly, I'm going to do it the best I can. All right? We stir one another to love and good works. We serve one another. Serve one another. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Okay? We go back into Romans. Paul's writing about, you know, the freedom that we have in Christ. <clears throat> but he says, what then shall we say? Do we sin all the more? Absolutely not. There is no more emphatic word in the Greek. There's no more emphatic combination of words in the Greek than what Paul uses to say, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, in, in some translations it said, may it not be. May it never be. Because we don't really have a good way to carry the emphasis. But, we do use this to serve one another. I mean, you know, we talked about encouraging one another. How, how can we serve? How can we serve? Now, I said a little bit ago, this is a two-way street. I can't serve you if you don't know, let me know how I can. I can't serve you if you don't let me know where your lack is, where your hurt is, where your need is. The church is completely ineffective, rendered impotent in your life if you close off and hold yourself apart and hold yourself aloof. They will never be able to minister to you effectively. And that way lies bitterness. I've been in this church for three and a half days and nobody has come up to help me. I've been in this church for three and a half years and nobody has come up to help me. You know, um, you want friends, you got to be friendly. You want to be served, you've got to serve. You want to, people to be praying for you, to encourage you, to uplift you, open your life up to them. Yeah, I know it's dangerous. There's a danger in this because people are stupid. <laughs> and people do stupid things. I do them. I do them all the time. You can tell when I've done something stupid because I say, oh, man, note. I always refer myself by the last name when I do something stupid. And Christy knows. She'll hear me say, oh, man, note from the other one. She'll go, oh, what'd you do? <laughs> Nothing, dear. Just stay out there for a moment. Where's the mop? <laughs> but it's a two-way street. We have to be open. We have to be willing to lay it on the line. We have to be willing to potentially let it get stepped on. But I guarantee you, you will let God work through the body that he has put you in. God will work. Okay? I'll tell you a kind of a funny story about that. When we first came to Jesus Community Church, I brought my notebook. I brought my notebook because I used to write down notes of all the messages and stuff. And, uh, they weren't notes. They, were, they, were not, they weren't even really critiques. They were just criticisms. And I would say, ooh, they need to fix that. <laughs> that's not quite right. He, that's not the proper rendering of that in Greek. And he's kind of got that wrong. Why does the man pace? <laughs> he needs to stand still. But I, I have my list, and I, I sat right back over here, about where Laura is sitting, and I made my list. And we were here for about three months, and uh, I was very hard of heart. Obviously, I was writing a list of criticisms. And uh, God was slowly breaking down the walls of my heart and pulling out brick by brick. A little bit of light was starting to shine through, and, and I was actually starting to hear him again. Instead of just being the only voice in the room, full of complaints and antagonistic feelings. Uh, there was light coming in, and one of the days I was praying, and I actually took time to listen. And he said, I, you know that list that you wrote? Yeah. So I want you to get it. And I'm thinking, yes, he's going to fix them. <laughs> he said, you see that list? I said, yep. He said, I want you to help him fix them. Me? Yeah, I want you to get involved, and I want you to help fix these things. Uh, 
well, that's not really my job. I'm the list maker. <laughs> my job is list making. Other people's job is the list doing. <laughs> but he, he really got on to Christy and I. And, and he told us, I want you to get involved, and I want you to start fixing these things that are not working right. Make them better. Now, you'd be amazed how many things fell off my list. <laughs> I'd be absolutely amazed. <laughs> what? Really? That's not a problem. That's just my stupid attitude. <laughs> okay, we can let that one go. So, how do we serve one another? Another point, instruct one another. Romans 15, 14, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. You realize I'm not the only teacher here? Do you realize that? Do you realize that teaching doesn't necessarily consist of putting together a lesson and giving it to a classroom? That teaching oftentimes takes place and it's actually most effective one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I was tremendously blessed um, the night of the outreach, the Halloween outreach, because uh, one of the men came in and he was really struggling. He just had a bad day. He actually had a bad couple of days. And I was caught up in the middle of doing something. I wanted to go talk to him, but I had to finish something first. And as I wrapped up what I was doing, I turned around and looked, and one of the other men was talking to him. He was encouraging him. Yes. Then a little bit later, I came over to this building, and he was over here, and another one of the men was talking to him and encouraging him. Do you realize how much more effective the body is when everybody's a minister than it is when I'm the only minister. Uh, I, I can't reach all of you. I can't reach all of you. There's not enough time in the day for me to effectively reach all of you. I need you to reach all of you. We, we need to work this together. Okay? So, able to instruct one another. Honor one another. Romans 12.10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. Outdo one another. You know that whole mutual admiration society thing. <laughs> We've got such fantastic people in this church that it's very easy to show honor. You don't have to look very far. As a matter of fact, you probably look right next to you. Right in front of you, right behind you. There's someone around you that you can show honor to. Outdo one another in showing honor. <clears throat> be kind and tender-hearted to one another. Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Oh, here we go. We're back to it again. In the body of Christ, you're not allowed to bear grudges. Not allowed. Whistle blows. Flag flies. Foul! Technical! <laughs> You're not allowed to carry a grudge. you got to forgive. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. As a matter of fact, we back up in Colossians. I'm going to hit this again. We just read it tonight. He says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. And that's, that's what we're supposed to do. This is how the body operates. Okay? We lift each other up. We encourage one another, we instruct one another, we support one another, we minister to the needs of one another, spiritual, physical, mental, social. What needs do you have? Uh, I'm, I am one of those guys, I don't like people to know when I have a need. I don't want people thinking that I can't do it myself. You know, when we get to prayer, I'm going to have a prayer request that I've, I've had for about three months and I haven't shared because I don't, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, that's garbage. So, forgiving one another. Did you catch that tender hearted? You know, in, in Colossians he says, um, having compassionate hearts, being tender hearted, being soft for one another, being willing to hurt when they hurt. I, I, man, I love laughing when people laugh. Boy, I get uncomfortable when people cry. I don't know what to do. You know, that was one of the things when Christian and I used to fight. 
she would cry. And I finally told her, look, if you're allowed to cry, I'm allowed to get mad. Because that's your natural reaction, and this is my natural reaction. So she quit crying. <laughs> okay, that took me a lot of years to finish. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad thing. Uh, I, I, I really, when people cry, I just, I don't know what to do. You know, because some people you hug, other people like, don't touch me. <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> but that's what we're called to do. Not perfectly, increasingly. Remember, none of us is perfect in all of this. We all blow it in many ways. Daily. But we're increasingly, we're striving. More and more, more and more. More tomorrow than today. Next year I should be able to look back and see growth. See a change. In 10 years, I should look back, and I shouldn't be able to even be able to comprehend the change. Because there should be that much more of Christ flowing through me. Jesus says in, uh, let's go ahead and flip over there, Luke chapter 6. Now, one of the things that we tend to do in the Christian realm is we like things in black and white, or, or red and white, if you have a red letter edition. We like them to put to us simply. We don't want to have to spend a lot of time thinking. Now, I want to kind of back up, and we're going to look through the book of Acts. I'm not even going to go there. But, uh, we see... Peter and Paul going on their journeys, and Paul goes with Barnabas, and then later he goes with uh, Salmanus, uh, Silas, and he goes and he goes into a town. And what's he do? He camps out, starts preaching the word, packs up, goes to another town. But what does he leave behind him? Besides people that hated him and were flinging rocks at him. Church. He left the church. Everywhere Paul went. He established a church. No place did he go that he told them, all right, now you got it, you're on your own. You're on your own, you're on your own, you're on your own. He said, no, we put them together. As a matter of fact, when he's speaking to Titus, he says, I left you there so that you could finish the work that I was not able to do, to establish the churches, to put overseers in charge of them. See, can I point to a single scripture that says you have to be in a church? I can point to a bunch of them. I just kind of did. But I can't point to a black and white where it says you, being you, insert your own name, have to be in a local fellowship. But what I can do is show you that the preponderance of scripture very clearly indicates that. Very clearly indicates that. Matter of fact, what was the apostle's job? Jesus said that I'm going to, through you, I'm going to establish my church. He tells Peter, upon this rock, not Peter the rock, but the faith that Peter showed, I will build my church. Okay? So we see this throughout Scripture. One of the things that he says in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Do you realize the contrast in this statement here? Because if he's your Lord, he's the master. He's the one that has the right to tell you to do whatever. And if you're acknowledging him as Lord, but not doing what he says, then he's not really your Lord, is he? Well, I'll let you be Lord of this, but not of thee. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me hears my words and does them. I will show you what he is like. Now check this out, because I bet you most of you didn't realize that this is the passage of Scripture that follows. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against his house and could not shake it because it had been well built. 
but the other one. But the other one, who hears and does not do them, is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. See, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this a step further. I'm going to tie this right back into my message. Because, see, God has called us to be part of his body, to be knitted in. If you are independent, if your church is uh, the TV at home, don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with you watching TV at home and getting edif edified and encouraged and teaching that way. But if that's the only thing you're getting, you're in trouble. That's not what God has called you to. He's called you to be knitted in, to be meshed, to be entwined with a body of believers so that when you have need, that need can be met through his body. Conversely, you are enmeshed, you are entwined, so when others have need that you can meet, you can meet it. Let's put this practically. I love listening to James McDonald. I think he's a fantastic minister. I think he's a fantastic preacher. Don't agree with everything he says, but that's okay. The things that I've disagreed with have been the non-essentials. But when I have a hurt, when I have a need, how long do you think it's going to take me to get a hold of James? <laughs> Who do I go to? Right here. This body. This fellowship. This body that I belong to. Okay? When I have need, this is the body that I go to. That's a wise man. That's the one that implements what Christ has directed in the totality of Scripture from beginning to end. This is how he has designed his body to work on earth. Interdependently. Codependently. Well, we hate that term, don't we? Codependence. <laughs> that person's codependent. I'll tell you what, I am codependent on my wife. Because there are things that she brings out in me that would not be there without her. And that would leave me blessed. That would leave me less. Okay? I depend on her. She depends on me. So I guess that's really the meaning of codependent. And if we're dependent together, that's the way this body is supposed to work. Amen? Amen. He's good. He is faithful. He has shown us the way that it works best.